right, everybody. I guess I'll start the show, even though it's not technically my show. Coast to Coast, Evan Ginsberg, uh, Buddy uh, Satello, and I'm Mike Lano. I'm the big mouth regular on the show. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to bring a longtime friend of mine to the show, M many decades. And this is Evan and I really have always appreciated Renaissance men, guys that have done it all, you know, uh, and in wrestling, Bill has done everything from a wrestler. Of course, I remember I'd moved away from the Los Angeles LaBelle territory to San Francisco, my secondary home base, but Bill was already uh, killing it with guys like Pistol Pete and uh, uh, tons of talent. Chris Adams, that was his first, that was his first territory, Bill, outside of, uh, of, of England. And uh, Gene LaBelle got him into uh, New Japan. But anyway, Bill has refed, announced, promoted, taught one of the premier trainers in all of wrestling. Uh, he's a babysitter to famous world champions. I won't go for more than that, but one and only Bill Anderson. And uh, Bill, the, one of the reasons, obviously I wanted to reconnect because I haven't seen you in years, um, but there were a number of shows and, and we're looking at people that have, uh, you know, tested positive, no symptoms for COVID and, and everything else, but they're and that's why I sought you out on social media, because there were these shows and podcasts and radio shows saying that you had it and all kinds of dire stuff. And, and I, who knows what to believe, you know? So that's why I contacted you, reached out and, and let people know, you know, what happened. And you look great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm now 64 years old. I, I am almost a complete senior citizen. I am on Social Security. So, you know, I, I'm living the American dream. I guess, you know, so, but I wanted to say hello to Evan. I haven't talked to you in years, Evan. Hey, Bill, good to I, see I, you. I did your show many years ago. Your, uh, the other, I guess you had a different show. Right, with Mike. With Mike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, with Mike, yeah. It was some back then, but yeah. But you gentlemen, I have the, nothing but respect for all you guys. All you guys. You're guys are great. You. Which Thank is why I agreed to do this because, you know, it's just you're important people in the business. You respect the business, and, and I respect that. Uh, but yes, I was sick. Uh, I, I started coming down with uh, really bad shortness of breath, first of all, which scared the living hell out of me uh, because I am a few pounds overweight, maybe more than a few. And uh, so that, that always scares me. And then I started getting these headaches that were purely from hell. Uh, I mean, uh, it was just like somebody banging on my head with a hammer. Uh, and uh, I was really in a lot of uh, pain. So I went and got tested, and sure enough, I had it. And the doctor there at this uh, hospital recommended not hospital treatment, but he says, go home, be alone, drink tons of water, try to eat what, you, what your system can handle, keep your nutrients high, take zinc, take your vitamins. You know, I take an old, old man's vitamins, and, and I take all my vitamin C and vitamin D, and I, I take a really a crap load of vitamins. I'm big on vitamins. And he says, just take it easy, get off your feet, relax, and chill out for a while. And that's exactly what I did. I didn't leave home for two weeks. And uh, I slowly started feeling better, although a few days ago I started coming down with some headaches again, but they went away pretty quickly. It worried me. For one full day, I had a bad, bad headache. reminded me of the covid uh, and I, it went away, and uh, I've been feeling great since. And uh, so I suppose I'm over it. I went back, and I got tested twice, and they said, you're done at this point with it. So I'm praying to God that is the truth, and, and I'm done. And uh, because I can live without that in my life. You know, God, uh, the, the world is tough enough to live in without that, oh, yeah. you know. Just paying our bills on time is enough to worry us to death. What was the first symptom? Because, you know, you, you everybody's different, and it, it's a unique thing when it happens, and, and some people get the loss of taste and smell. Was that, did that happen to you? Hello? Oh, did you lose taste and smell, or, or there's the headaches and the uh, the uh, congestion? It seems like your, we lost uh, connection there for a second here. No, oh. you, you're coming in fine. Can you hear me Okay. Marlene, they can't hear me. No, I can hear you. Okay. Can Bill, Bill, can't, hear? Bill can't hear Mike, right? Uh-oh. And now I Bill froze. We might be losing Bill, unfortunately. Well, why don't you guys ask him Ask him that if uh, what happened with taste and smell. Oh, he froze up. Yeah, he oh, is okay. frozen up. 
Okay. Um, so, a nice picture. Uh, Mike, uh, uh, or, or actually Evan, you want to uh, promote uh, 350 Days? While you <laughs> yeah. have... Oh man! Or actually, your new Let's book. Do you plugs can... while we unfreeze Bill. <laughs> yeah, 350 Days stars superstar Billy Graham, Bret Hart, Greg Valentine, Tito Santana, Paul Orndorff, and three dozen legends. Check it out. Amazon Prime, Tubi, uh, any major cable system. And Mike, what do you have to plug while we try to unfreeze Bill? Yeah, hopefully, uh, buddy Sotel is getting him. He's our our guru here. Um, well, don't forget, I, I didn't mention this because you and I were on that COVID charity uh, for a couple of hours yesterday, um, is that Ox Baker is a big highlight in the uh, 360 days, the, the film as well. 300, um, he's and, got the best lines in the entire he's film. He's got some of the best lines. People say Ox Baker steals the movie. He does. Yeah. Well, he he brings up the mood when they, you're you're kind of down for a little while. You know, the, the, the there's so many things that are depressing about yeah, it. He was the comic effect. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was great having uh, him. I, I'm trying to think. You, there were so many serious guys. Snuka. Um, you know, Brett was fairly serious as he usually well, superstar, is. Superstar Billy Graham, certainly his moments are very serious, you know, still wonderful to have, but, but they were, you know, his words of, of, of being involved in his experiences were really, you know, quite eye opening to me. I'd never heard about, you know, what his own thoughts were about, you know, his time in the ring until, until then. So Billy I'm still Graham trying to call. Bret Hart and like yin yang, you know, Bret Hart's very quiet and introspective and Billy Graham could read the phone book and he's so charismatic. You'd be riveted. I would sit and watch Billy Graham read the phone book for an hour. I, I wish we had footage of him in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So, buddy, I hope you're still working on. Uh, Bill. Yeah, I'm trying to get. Oh, okay. there we are. Bill, there. you're back. Bill, I can you hear me? OK. I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now you're back. You're Here's back what I was uh, asking, and then I was—I didn't know if you just couldn't hear me, and I was asking uh, Evan and Buddy to to say, did the the difficulty breathing was that was your first symptom, and or did you have the loss of taste and smell, or did you never lose your taste? Yeah, and smell? I have a bit of loss of uh, taste and smell, mm. just a little, but it was mostly the breathing that really scared me. I was laying in bed one night and I caught myself trying to catch my breath several times, which scared me to death. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, I, cause I honestly thought I, I'm not getting blood to my heart. Obviously I thought that I thought maybe I'm having a, some kind of a mild heart attack. I thought anything is possible at this point. Uh, I was really alerted to that. And, uh, uh, I went, uh, the next day to the doctor because I, I could not, I, couldn't live. I mean, I was afraid to keep going on. Uh, yeah. Bre breathing uh, so, is important. Oh, sorry. So, so yes. Bill, yes. Uh, yes. for a lot of the uh, the the of our of our uh, fans that follow the show are not that familiar with your entire body of work. You can you tell us how you got started in professional wrestling and then the path that you 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 followed on your way through your career. Sure. And before I t tell you about the path I followed, I was thinking about this the other day when people say they're not as familiar with me like you just did. And I thought about the reason, and it's a really good reason, is I spent so many years wrestling under so many different names under a mask that I, I lost that uh, uh, ability to be a little more fan-friendly to people. Like uh, Bill Anderson was not my only name. I wrestled under a mask for WWF as the Black Knight the white shadow on TV tapings because I had to cover my face because I was a ring announcer. I wrestled in Japan and Mexico as uh, as Starman and in Mexico as the mercenaries and Japan as the mercenaries and in Japan as one of the psychos. So I was always covered up with a gimmick. So I lost all my Japan. Five months of my life I spent in Japan wrestling was never as Bill Anderson. So I lost that international part of me. And the same in Mexico. Well, Mexico, I was split between wearing a mask and being Bill Anderson. But a lot of the time in, in my even in this country, I spent working under a hood, which people aren't as familiar with you then because I wasn't on the national TV as much. I did 
tapings for Vern and for WWF as Bill Anderson. But when I became a ring announcer for events in, in the late 80s, so, uh, going uh, taking Lee Marshall's position, uh, after that point on, I had to start wearing a hood on TV. And then so I lost all these people that would say, hey, that's Bill Anderson on TV. Nobody would know who I am anymore. So I just became an anonymous mask guy from Parts Unknown. Let me but, throw this out. I want to throw this out to credit Bill, too, because uh, he trained so many great people. But when you were, in the, were the mercenaries, and I shot you guys at various shows, remember, I, I think, weren't you guys on the uh, the very first Onita card down there in Southern California? Yes, uh, yes. The FMW guys? Uh, wind tapings for Red Bastine, too, uh, in San Bernardino, at the San Bernardino Arena. Uh, and we were the mercenaries, too. There. And that was uh, Louis Spicoli, who you guys trained that we miss to yeah, this I, day. One of the greatest yeah. guys ever, Tim Patterson. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, the great Goliath trained Tim Patterson, but yeah, good, Tim is a great guy. Too, great, one of my most trusted partners ever. Uh, definitely. Uh, great man, Gordon and Goliath. Uh, somebody was talking about that Evan on that. Uh, it was on somebody's show. Uh, oh no, it was on, uh, and, and they were uh, claiming that. Uh, Mark Lewin and uh, uh, Skandor Akbar, when he was a babyface in L.A., were wrestling Black Gordon. He didn't come into L.A. until 68. And Goliath came later, and I don't believe they'd ever teamed together before they put him together uh, if it was Jules Strongbo in Los Angeles. But that's a whole another story. But um, the wind that's tapings, that and was. there's a ton of guys you trained there, but you and Bastine... Uh, with Sting and Jim Helwig, Ultimate Warrior. I mean, those are your guys. And, yeah, and Angel of Death, uh, uh, Dave Sheldon, yeah. and Steve DeSalvo was in that group, too. Two yeah. major, major uh, Calgary, Stu Hart, Stampede uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. legends. And, of course, they had big, major Japan careers. But right. some people you trained... A great guy, great guy. Been to his grave in Texas, uh, right outside of Dallas, and... Uh, Dave is another missed human being, a uh, really fantastic man. He used to come to uh, Red Bastine's Texas shootouts. You know, it was his own uh, thing, and it was so great seeing him there. And what a nice guy, just incredible. Tremendous. Uh, I, I really I really miss Dave quite a bit. It would, uh, I sat in tears. Uh, he was uh, cremated, and, he, and he's in like a rock uh, formation at the cemetery uh, outside of Dallas, uh, and I, I sat on the spot where his cremains are, and I sat in tears uh, just thinking about Dave. What a tremendous man he was, and he was so young to die. And uh, I, I don't know, it just you know, it's like Louis Spicoli. It's like it's like all you could sit here. We could do ten hours a show and talk about Hercules and Davy Boy, and uh, and Nightheart and all the rest of them that we've lost that were great men, great friends great talents and uh you know the list goes on and on but i i certainly miss uh, dave sheldon and i miss the ultimate warrior for that matter i mean hey how much more of an honor could i have on his last three days of life that he mentions me on his his uh, uh hall of fame speech and me and red bastine right. yeah. and and i'm telling you i will forever i'll take that to my grave as one of the highlights of my life mm -hmm. uh because to know that I was on Dave uh, on uh, on Jim's mind, you know, and uh, Jim treated me with the utmost respect, always, always, always. Uh, I have nothing but good things to say about Jim, and I know a lot of people badmouth Jim for his talent that he showed in the ring and everything else, but you know what? The bottom line too, and a lot of this is he put asses in seats, like the, like Bischoff would say. He put butts in seats, and he knew how to sell tickets, and he did the gimmick that Vince wanted him to do. No different than Hulk Hogan. We've all seen Hulk Hogan wrestle. Oh, connection lost. You know, uh, actually, I thought he he his work rate was better in Dallas for Fritz. I think we lost Bill again. Did we? He, oh, he, no. It was going so well, too. Yeah. Oh, well, you really? know. COVID, COVID can't knock him out, but Skype can. That's right. That's right. Um, I will I will hang up on him, and I'll call him again, and hopefully we can get him back in on. And, on and, yeah, I was just and really Mike, getting Mike and I will improv meanwhile. <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I really wanted to ask him about, you know, uh, 
uh, working a, as a mass wrestler, especially one of those old school mass wrestlers, because that to me is my fascination. It, well, what's you, interesting, what I wanted to ask him before he uh, was rudely uh, <laughs> destroyed by Skype, um, I remember when Hogan and Warrior had that big match, and they, they actually were wrestling for part of that match. You know, they actually showed some holds. And I'm sure the guy was capable, but uh, if Vince says, you know, uh, run around like a lunatic, I guess that's what the guy's going to do, you know? Yeah, that's the, the problem with that group. But I, if you looked at him as a dingo warrior in world class for first, I remember him then. Yeah, he was actually doing more holds and stuff. It wasn't all that stuff. So, yeah, he might not have been the world's greatest wrestler. Certainly Hogan wasn't because Lou Thez would always, you know, use his patent that he, Hogan doesn't know a wristwatch from a wrist lock thing. But he gave him props because he made a ton of people money, including himself. So, yeah, you know, um, not, certainly not uh, Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson stuff, but but you want to know that's that's what the era uh, demanded. God sadly, didn't make money, which is you know a criminal. Maybe that's because the promoters and bookers didn't know how to use somebody like that. Because other guys had tremendous careers. I don't know, Evan. Were you at the Garden uh, when Vince Senior? Almost every Garden show or every other Madison Square Garden show from about '76 on, he would bring in talent from other areas. Like oh yeah. Mike Graham, and, and I remember, because uh, John Arizzi filmed it, it was Don Curtis and Eddie Graham against the fabulous kangaroos, Al Costello. Yeah, I wasn't there for that. but that was um, uh, Mike, uh, a neighbor of mine, just up the street, and a friend of mine is Al Costello's nephew. Really? Oh, because so, his, uh, his sister lives in San Francisco on Broadway Street. Yeah, that's, that's his, uh, her... Her son is is a friend of mine. So will you ask the guy. Will you give the guy my email and tell him to contact me? Because I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. But if I no. do, I, I I will. He gave me some great original kangaroo memorabilia from 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 uh, from some of the shows that he'd worked and throw and, the boomerang uh, at his head, and this way he'll remember you. Yes. Well, that's exactly. when they would throw to fans because at that period they were a little bit after Gorgeous George, where Gorgeous George would throw the gold bobby pins to the crowd. Uh, the original Fabulous Kangaroos, Al Costello and Roy Heffernan, would throw paper and plastic boomerangs out to the crowd, even though they were heels. So yeah, very I have one of those. I have one of those uh, boomerangs. Hey, Mike, well, hey, it's it's no different than uh, when um, Brett the Hitman Hart was part of the Hart Foundation. He was kind of a heel, but he would give those like little uh, glasses. Those. The, well, he the, was turning face by that point. Yeah, Vince well, would never let a heel give out. Uh, Mike, were you with me at Cauliflower Alley when we had dinner with uh, Kowalski and um, Thez and yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a bunch of legends. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, it doesn't guy, feel like the that anymore. The guy anymore. from the kangaroos. Well, every, almost every cauliflower alley Al would go to, and then at my convention that you were my number two guy helping me with in St. Louis, the Sam Munchnik three-day weekend, Al Costello would break out and sing opera. But yeah. one year at cauliflower alley, Al starts singing opera, and then Paul Bill's Bashan, back. Bill's uh, back, everybody. Butcher pa Paul Vachon would start singing. We were just talking about, like, Bill, I wish you'd have come to my St. Louis convention that Evan helped me with in 92, May of 92. It was packed. None of the boys had to pay for their vendor tables. I got all their vendor tables free. I even got them free loner Polaroids and Polaroid film and stuff. But Al Costello, at, at, at least, well, there, he'd get up and sing opera when I had him up at the dais you know, accepting awards and stuff, but at Cauliflower Alley, and you didn't miss one for, I don't know how many years. Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, Paul Vachon got up and started singing, then Al Costello sang. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what was, was your first? Oh, go ahead. Al Costello was there uh, when he came with his uh, Australian outfit on and everything. What a nice man. Tremendous. Oh, oh, oh we're one of the greatest. Many, many times for the Sheik, him and, him and Don Kent, against... Ben Justice and the Stomper. Great old matches. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Stomper Guy Mitchell, we were talking about this yesterday, of course, was Jerry, Gentleman Jerry Valiant, a little bit later. And so great to see, you know, a guy who 
had worked in Indianapolis and worked in Michigan, really. And I, I think he was probably also on some Toronto Maple Leaf Garden shows uh, for Tunney. Uh, but, you know, when he hit Vince Sr., that was a huge, huge deal to be part of all that. Boy, that Detroit. Co- so did you get to go to, to Kobo? Did you when you were I a kid? I shows at Kobo uh, when I was a teenager in the early 70s. Uh, I unfortunately never got to work in that building as a pro, but I saw many shows there, and every show was classic. From beginning to end, when you had opening matches with guys like Pat O'Connor and the opening match of an all-star show of matches, you know, I mean, my God, you know, it was just a who's who of the business. I loved it. I loved it. Because that was a period when he was battling... Bruiser came in from Indianapolis, the headquarters of WWA, to take on the Sheik for control of Detroit. And, and uh, did you go to night. Bruce? It was the same night? I never, I never went to the Olympia shows, but they were running sometimes competitively the same night to, you know, what more competition can you have than that? But yeah. Dick's, shows, Dick's shows were pretty stacked, too, because he'd have uh, Ernie Ladd and Von Raschke, the Valiants, Heenan, of course, on all of them. Uh, Wilbur Snyder was his partner, but, you know, Wilbur was a legend, of course, in L.A., really, where he was a, a legend in the 50s and 60s. Sure. Uh, but Olympus Stadium was, like, pretty dangerous. Eddie, the Sheik, Ed Farrett would, you know, tell, and other guys, Dave Brzezinski told me how dangerous that was, versus Kobo, air-conditioned, beautiful Kobo, a spectacular venue. But those cards, so... The NWA would send all this talent. It was similar to, remember, Mike LaBelle had the battle, Vern Gagne at the Forum with Jack Kent Cook, and Vern only ran two or three shows tops, but they were loaded. Like he had uh, the, the first one that Vern had, I remember, Vern against Bruiser, who was a heel still for the AWA strap, and then he had uh, um, uh, Larry Hennig against Thez. The Vashans were on it. You know, it was a, a pretty stacked card. But over on the other thing, Moscaris uh, against Gordman, Hare versus Mass, Fred Blassie challenging Dory Funk Jr. for the end of Bay. You know, all of that insane stuff. Like the opening match for that thing was Ray and Pat against uh, Don Leo Jonathan and uh, the King Curtis. That's the opening match? That's the freaking wow. opener. Wow. That would be a main event anywhere, anywhere. Mike, let me tell you a story. The first time I met the Sheik was in 1991, uh, Eddie Farhat, in, in Japan. We got up, me and my partner, uh, a guy named um, Lou Fabiano, we were working as the yeah. mercenaries. And uh, because Louis Spicoli didn't want to leave his girlfriend on his first possible tour of Japan, I took Lou Fabiano, who was a fabulous worker, a tremendous great guy, a good worker. So I took him with me. So we get on, we get out of Narita Airport, and there's a bus waiting for us. And as I walk onto this bus, first person onto the right behind the driver's seat is the Sheik. And next to him on the other side is Sabu. And then on in the back, there's Big Titan, uh, 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 Mike Awesome, right, right. Mark Star, all these guys, uh, Mike Balea, you know, Hogan's nephew. All these guys are toward the back of the bus. So me and Lou get on. But as I see the Sheik, he sticks his hand out and he says, I'm the Sheik. And I look at him like, like, I don't know who you are. I says, I know exactly who you are. I'm from Detroit. And I shook his hand, and we went on about our ways. And and the first night on the tour, I was working a tag match against the Sheik. And the Sheik uh, tells, uh, he tells uh, Sabu, he says, you take this other guy, Fabiano. He says, you take him, do whatever you're going to do around the building. He says, I want this guy because he's from Detroit, and he knows me. Because I already acted like a mark to him. I already... I already bowed down, man. I said, you, you are the heel of all heels. Yeah. Nobody ever than the Sheik, ever, ever. So he knew I wasn't going to mess with him and hurt him or do anything because he was an older man at that point. But I got to tell you, the, the, the point of the story is uh, it was on the next tour when I was there, when Sheik was there, and he says to me, he says, you know when I met you that night and I, coming off the uh, air, out of the airport? And I said, yeah. He says, you know, I did the same thing with you that I did with all the other guys. He says, I shook hands with you with my right hand. but my left hand, I had five razor blades on my hand. Yeah. And if you would have messed with me, if you would have been some cocky younger guy thinking that you're better than me or you don't know who I am or you disrespected me, mm. I'd cut you. I'd have cut you. And I was like, okay, well, I'm glad I'm a mark. You know what? Because I respected the man. There was no way I would treat anybody like that anyway. But, hey, the Sheik was just the Sheik. 
you know, that. that Bill, he, well, do you agree? I've said this before, and I shot pretty much in all the territories. Greatest heel of all time for that era, you know, maybe up to 84, what have you, but so colorful. Incredible. He was, he had, and did not even have to talk. Didn't even no. have to cut a promo. Yeah, but you, you know? put it, you pair him together with Ernie Roth as Abdullah Farouk, and you got something fantastic yeah, there. With Reachman, who wasn't even on the same level to me as as Ernie Roth, but still, the Sheik was just the greatest. He had the greatest gimmick to come yeah. to the ring, you know, with the, the whole head, the, you know, boots, the pointed boots and everything. He just he had the whole look of mystique that is so missing from the business. I, have, I don't have to tell you guys that. But it's missing from the business nowadays. I ran his fan club in the mid '60s. That's how I started in the oh. mid '60s, and his international fan club. Then got to manage him on the Gordon Scazzari shows and some other indies. But Evan was at the Evan. Were you at both of the uh, the Asbury Park, New Jersey? That that was uh, Gordon Scazzari's house show. And then, of course, Lowell Mass was the whole TV thing, which the Sheik ended up having to replace Eddie Gilbert as Booker, lead Booker with Dutch Mantel for that thing. But I I got to, you know, I was part of that booking committee too, underling guy. But so I'm managing as EF Sharif and the Sheik personally took the burnous, wrapped it around my head. I was doing a tribute to Ernie Roth. I was just stealing all his lines. I had the glasses, all of the stuff. So it was sort of like Grand Wizard meets Abdullah Farouk. But, and we have another friend of mine, Chris Cruz, doing the interview. We're taking on TNT and... Uh, well, that's Sabio Vega, TNT and Hercules Ayala, who just died a couple of weeks ago. And um, and I tell uh, Sheik ahead of time to recreate what he did in L.A. with Miguel Alonso and eat Chris Cruz's tie. And then he threw a fireball at uh, Cruz. Only time Chris Cruz has you know, participated in an angle as a wrestling announcer. So much fun. We destroyed the rental car. Gordon's Kazari got for us from Asbury driving to Lowell, Massachusetts, which was Vince Sr.'s old building, um, in the snow because it was January. It, it, it's trash. Both of the rearview mirrors were sheared off because I couldn't drive. I didn't know how to drive in black ice or any of that stuff yeah. that you would know. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but no, listen to this last thing. I'll okay. shut up because the other guys have to talk. We go to breakfast and the sheik picks up the tab for everyone that was there. And there must have been 20, 30 guys. And he picks up the tab. He goes, you tell Meltzer that I picked up the tab because he's been writing how cheap I am for years. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's funny. So even he, the, the greatest of all time, is aware of Dave Oh, Meltzer. are we losing our connection again? Jeez. Oh. Well, you seem okay for the moment, so... Damn it! We'll we'll we'll, we'll it, keep it, it going. It, here, until, Bill, I just his his picture froze. No, you, so far I, you still seem okay, but I wanted to know, Bill, how you got started. How, you what, can't hear us. Uh, nope. Now now he got he got cut. I'm gonna I'll try connecting with him I again. I think Ox Baker right behind him is haunting his apartment. <laughs> uh, is there a picture of Ox? Picture uh, Ox Baker right behind him. Yeah. I didn't know. See that part, I didn't know because he's written two books. But the and I, I sent him a ton of photos for both books, like I got to do with uh, yours. Actually, can you let people know? Uh, talk up your book if you haven't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, the book is called Wrestling Rings, Blackboards, and Movie Sets. And uh, I have worked as a film producer, a teacher. I've worked in various capacities in wrestling, and. Uh, a story in there is about Gordon Scazzari. I have, a, I have It's brutal. It's yeah. brutal, Mike. Oh my God. He didn't. He All right, didn't he's he, back. Yeah, he's Bill's back. I was I just saying, Bill. <laughs> before we lose you, Bill, if people want to learn about your incredible life, everybody in wrestling <laughs> has is so blessed. I haven't even talked. We haven't even told people how long you and Jesse Hernandez. How many years did you guys? You kind of ran all the house shows and probably way more than I even know, besides refing, ring announcing, wrestling uh, in the 80s. When did that start? Was that like 83 or 84 you guys started doing that? Oh, uh, well, we started running independent shows in the in the late 80s and, and mid through the mid 90s. Uh, I, I was a part of that up until 2000. Um, but you, and, yeah, you had your, you had EWF in was it San Bernardino or Bakersfield, the home base? San Bernardino, San Bernardino. San Bernardino. Uh, but before that, weren't you guys setting up 
the ring for pretty much all of Vince's house shows in many, many well, states. Well, it was me. I was in charge of the ring crew. Uh, for yeah, the, that's for, a big deal. For Southern, for Southern California. And I actually did the ring at often, not often, but at times all the way to Portland, to Seattle, uh, through Arizona. Uh, I did the ring at different times and all through different parts of California, depending on when they were running two and three shows a night sometimes. They were splitting things off quite a bit, and I had to be all over the place in conjunction with the Northern California crew, which was Mike Porter and some other guys running that. that you probably knew Mike Porter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I was doing that for a long time. And uh, uh, and I would work an, in, I would work an opening match on a lot of those shows. Uh, they would throw me in just to give me some extra pay, and I would work with Bob, Bob uh, 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 Orton Jr., Bob Orton Jr. or Ted Arcidi or Tim Patterson or Greg Valentine. I'd, I'd work with different guys that maybe they were short a guy or a guy ended up there extra for some reason. They'd throw another match on. Chief was real good with me. Rene Goulet, uh, some of the road agents treated me really good. Uh, uh, Nick Bockwinkle was one of the exceptional road agents and would always treat me uh, exceptionally well. Uh, well loved Nick loved you. Uh, Nick was Nick was just one hell of a man in every aspect of being a wrestler. And, and <coughs> I can't say enough good things about Nick. Uh, but real briefly, before we get disconnected again, I can tell you my origins in the business. Yeah, please, and please. I'm I, so I, curious. I, I started out in 1973 training with Kurt Von Steiger, who was part of the Von Steiger Brothers tag team with Carl. And uh, they came to Arizona to start uh, promoting wrestling here. Uh, and I started uh, training with Kurt. I wanted to be a wrestler. I was six foot two, 140 pounds, soaking wet. And uh, I, I wish I was about 240 now, maybe not 140 and not 340. But I was about 140 pounds. And Kurt, I, I would set his ring up for him. And I ended up ring announcing for him and refereeing. How, that's how I broke into the business. Uh, and uh, eventually training with him, of course. And Kurt moved on up to see, uh, back up to Portland, which is his home base uh, for Don Owen in late 1973. And I went up there with him, moved in with him and his wife. And uh, I would train at the Portland Sports Arena with Sandy Barr and, our, uh, and uh, 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 Jesse, Jesse Barr. Jesse, Jesse was, and, and what's funny is Jesse was in high school the same time as Matt Bourne and I, all in three different high schools in the same. Uh -huh. Same year, we were all juniors in high school in three different parts of uh, Portland. Right. And uh, uh, I used to amateur wrestle against Jesse, and as good as he was, he never beat me once. And I'm not bragging, and I'm not lying. It's just a shoot. Uh, Kurt would pay me. A, he, he, he pulled me aside he, on a Saturday morning. He'd say, I'll give you 10 bucks if you could kick Jesse's ass. Yeah. He said, just to show Sandy. And I would get in there, and I was not the greatest amateur but I was determined not to embarrass my trainer, and I had a will, and I had been an amateur wrestler in high school through the years in Phoenix here, so I, I was able to defeat Jesse, and I heard later he was a state champion. He did all kinds of things, and mm. I don't know how I ever beat him. I mean, now, now I look back, and it was like, I wish I would have had that on videotape. God. But uh, I have some tournaments, some booklets, not with me in here where I'm living now, but in my storage of, of some tournaments where Matt Bourne was Matt Osborne was on the same tournaments as me. Uh, he was at a different weight class. I think he was uh, weight heavier than me because uh, he was built more like a wrestler than I was at the time. I was a skinnier guy. and uh, But uh, some cool memories of, of training in Portland. But in 74, I came back to Phoenix, and that's how I broke into wrestling. The guys around Phoenix promoting indie wrestling knew I was training, and they thought I would be ready by that point. And I did start working here in Arizona at that point. And uh, a friend of yours, Mike, I hope he's a friend of yours, uh, Don Wilson, oh, uh, yeah. was uh, was my first promoter I ever worked for. And uh, Don hired me. And uh, uh, great memories of Don. Don was a, just one of the most respectful men I've ever met in my life. And no, he was one of my best friends, too. I don't know. I forgot what the cause of his neck injury but when I was uh, put on the, he nominated me to be in 1975 to go uh, work with him on the WFIA. And he was yeah. president. He had taken, or he was the lead guy there. Mike Ratchner took it over from him. No, Don was terrific. He came into our LA office for a couple of years and was working with Art Williams. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Oh, well, no, Don, no, Don is Don, Rip Day. Yeah, Don left Mike at some point and took Pistol Pete with him, and they they brought a ring to Phoenix, and that's how they started promoting. And Don stayed here for several months, but it was a losing proposition in the whole scheme of things. You know, just trying to pay the boys twenty, fifteen, thirty dollars a night, whatever it was. Uh, it, it was just it was hard on Don, and he ended up leaving and went back to L.A. at that point. And I don't know if he went back for Mike or whatever, but probably not. I think there was some uh, harsh business dealings there or something. But because uh, Mike wasn't the easiest guy to deal with, yeah. uh, I got along fine with Mike, but a lot of people didn't. I know he hated Tolis, he hated Blassie. Uh, there was a lot of <sighs> disconnection. Oh no. Well, I hope you're not going to disconnect and you can still hear me. Bill, can you hear me? No, he can't. <sighs> can you hear me? Uh. This is like he keeps tagging out and uh, yeah, yeah, me, and my, me and Mike carry on and, and uh, Buddy does the engineering. It's uh, quite a show. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it, his stories are fascinating. It's just so sad that, you know, we're all captive in this COVID time of of whether your Skype connection is good enough for your internet. I just want him, I want to, you know, I don't mean to be hogging the interview like usual, but they, they do have in Phoenix, and they've had it for many years, it was Raz. I mean, it was probably there for 50, 60 years. And when I ask him about Phoenix's Madison Square Garden. Let, let Evan ask a question. He hasn't asked uh, one yet in the inter, in the interview. Evan, <laughs> ask him about the, the, the Madison Square Garden of Phoenix. Yeah. Well, you, can, it, you can ask him, I'm fine. <laughs> I had a nice Korean soup. I'm happy. Yeah, you're you're you you're you're in mellow mode tonight. But you know, I I, I just uh, 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 Bill has just such a great fountain of information. I I I am still interested to find find out what made him decide to start getting involved in wrestling. Was it who inspired him? You know, what was the the wrestlers? Who were the wrestlers that he watched as a kid that made him want to get in the ring? That's always interesting to me. You know, he, watched, he watched The Miz. He was a big fan of The Miz when he Yes, was, exactly. Yeah. Ran, Randy Orton was still, they were still rerunning Randy Orton matches back then. The, the interesting thing, he's talking about Mike LaBelle uh, not getting along with his own talent. Well, Fred Blassie broadcast to most everybody that, that, that he and Tolis is the main event on the Outdoor Coliseum show, August 23rd of 1971. Got uh, now, cheated how do you remember day. that that was in August 23rd? Well, Evan knows. We, we talked about this last night. Uh, what was it, December 10th, 1973? Bruno at the Garden reclaimed the title from Stan Stasiak, who That's 11 right. days earlier had taken it from Pedro. You know, the, the Vince Sr. Had, had begged Bruno to get the strap back on him because April 30, 1977, Billy Graham beats Bruno in Baltimore. I barely remember my kids' birthdays these days. <laughs> So like that, that's uh, not and as they're twins. This. So I only have to remember one birthday, and I still barely remember what day that was. So for you guys to remember the exact hour and yeah, time. but that stuff because that stuff was important. The title didn't change hands every three days, like in yeah. Back, back then, beat Billy Graham, February 20, 1978 at the Garden, and uh, I was there. It was very traumatic for me because I was a huge Billy Graham fan. <laughs> there there he we is. are. We're back. We there don't give is. up on you. I'm going to start wrestling as a magician. Yeah, exactly. Bill, Bill's like tagging in and out. It's like a wrestling match. Oh, like my God. Here. This is it's just horrible. If I would have known I was going to have this bad of a connection where I'm living now, I would have driven my car into Phoenix and oh. sat in my car and done this. Hey, Bill, well, let me ask you something. You made the effort. That it's, artwork behind you, is that Scott Wilson's artwork? It's, it certainly is. Wow, I know his style. I have about 16 of his paintings, I believe. Wow. Yeah, uh, he's done some he's done some really cool ones. One of my favorites is on another wall I'm looking at of uh, Peter Laurie, great uh, mm. great actor from yeah, the 40s. Yeah. That's one of my closest friends. We we, we oh, were yeah. very close to each other. Yeah, yeah, Scott and I are in touch with each other pretty much almost on a daily basis. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, Scott's a great guy. Didn't he used to provide artwork for wrestling then and now, Evan? Um, no, I, I think he started well after that, but um he does beautiful work, and he has his own yeah. style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's done. A, he did he did a painting I gave to uh, Billy Graham uh, a while back, and I know he's done paintings for Ken Patera and Buddy Colt. 
uh, mm -hmm. and many guys like that of that level, you and, know. So uh, and, and those are your books behind you. Plug your books before we lose you again. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've done a couple of books. Uh, it's a it, these are uh, tribute books uh, to uh, fallen friends of wrestling in Mexico and in the U.S. Uh, on this book is Red Bastine, the Sheik, of course, Big John Stud, Bruiser Brody, Randy Savage, Jack Briscoe, one of the greatest guys I've ever met. Never had a chance to work with him, but I got to watch him work. And uh, a tremendous guy, Professor Tanaka, you know, you guys know all oh, yeah. these. Bruiser and Crusher and uh, Big Boss Man, Andre, Blassie, uh, Brody. A lot of these yeah, guys. That's my shot of Bruiser and Crusher from the Chicago Amphitheater down there bottom right. Is it? Okay, credit to Mike Lano. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. That was the and night, they took the, that was the night they took the straps inside. from Dick and Ray. I think inside I do give you some photo credit inside here, Mike. But anyway, my books are available at uh, www.bigbillanderson.us. It's a simple little website. I have some pictures I sell in my books. It's nothing big and fancy. Uh, uh, but anyway, that that's my books, and they're tribute books to some great friends. I have a lot of respect for, uh, for my friends that have left us in the business. Uh, a lot of what I do nowadays, I go to graves of, of famous wrestlers and people. I've, I just went to Chavo Guerrero's grave up in northern Arizona wow. a while back. Uh, I went to Dr. Jerry Graham's grave out in Riverside, California. And Eddie Guerrero is buried here in Scottsdale outside of Phoenix. So these were all friends, and I went to their graves and uh, uh, pay tribute to them and let the people know that they're still alive, uh, still alive in the heart of all of us, that, even though they passed on. And I put these videos on my YouTube channel, which is uh, Big Bill Anderson's Death Tours. And I go to cemeteries, but I also go to famous movie locations and things like that and put videos on, highlight specific actors and that sort of thing. That's what I do now. But before we get cut off, I'll jump back into 1983 yeah. uh, real quick. And I'll say this, uh, I think like Jeff Walton and Mike LaBelle are the ones that turned me on to Vince in 1983 when Vince bought out uh, Mike LaBelle at the end of 82. Uh, I worked his last show on December 26th at the, uh, 1982 at the San Bernardino Arena. I was uh, the beat the champ champion, the last beat the champ champion for Mike. And he sold out to Vince Jr. Vince came in in March of 83, wanted to book some locals on the show because he didn't want to fly in 20-man rosters. And Mike and Jeff recommended me, thank God, and others uh, that needed no introduction, guys like John Tolis, Wild Man Jack Armstrong, one of the greatest, as you know, Mike, one of the greatest guys on the face of the earth, yep. Jack, uh, Jack Armstrong, just tremendous. Uh, Black Gordman was on those shows. Well, Goliath came back and worked on those shows too. Uh, Pistol Pete didn't want to work on him because he didn't want to do a job, but that, oh. that's a whole other story. You know, Pete, Pete was one of those guys that I love Pete, but he's one of those guys that would rather make $25 and be in the main event than be in the opening match of a WWF show, and make 300 and lose. Yeah. I took the 300, I took right. the 300 and lost and I did it with a lot of, uh, a lot of fun. I got I got my foot in the door for Vince, which led to me having a career as a ring announcer, led to me doing other things in wrestling, like doing the ring crew where I was making good money for my family. I had a son born in 1989, so I had a family to feed. And Terry Garvin uh, and Pat Patterson treated me nothing but respect, utmost respect, both of those gentlemen, and they are bad mouth consistently. By no, no, no we did not on this show. Not we did a tribute show. show to Pat here, and we were talking about Pat because very close to Pat, as you know, L.A. and San Francisco are my home bases, bopping back and forth. I'd known Pat since like 71, 72, and sure. he was fantastic. And I can tell you, you know, I, I don't even, I, I'm not even going to say what I was going to say because it, you guys know who Pat and Terry were and in their hearts, what good people they were, what a credit to the business I felt they were. And Terry Garvin used to call me all the time and say, Bill, I got a spot in New Mexico to work four shows. You want to do it? Sure. He says, okay, I'll FedEx a ticket to you in the morning. FedEx the ticket comes to me. I got four shows making two fifty dollars a night. I come home. I come home and a couple weeks later, I got a check for $1,000 in the mail from my family, all because Terry thought of me. And there was no escapades involved and all that. It was strictly mm -hmm. business. And thank right. God. 
This guy was a real professional, and I love Terry Garvin, and I love Pat. And I had dealings with Mel Phillips, and I never saw any of this behavior. I could say this unequivocally. I never saw the behavior that others say they saw from all these gentlemen. I never saw it, and I was around them a lot, a lot. I have a photo I have to show you. Besides the photos I sent you for your two books, it's me and Mel Phillips in the back at uh, where it was either Hamburg or Philly where Vince Senior was doing his TV tapings in 75. John Arisi took the shot with my camera. Me and Mel Phillips, uh, the Valiants gave us the straps. It was either Ho and Gurria or the Valiants gave us the, the belts <laughs> to hold. And we're goofing around with the belts in the back. And yeah, you would never think. I mean, Mel Phillips was oh. announcing for many, many years. And yeah. first I mean, he brought you know, the... He was like Professor Elliot. He would bring the ring robes back to the back, and then he was uh, an announcer. I wanted to ask you this before I forget, then I'll shut up, is the heat with Tolis and Blassie. Now, Fred had told me that he had badmouthed Mike LaBelle after the August 71, 1971 Outdoor Coliseum show because he felt that he and John were cheated on their paydays. And right. that's why he accepted Vince Sr.'s offer to move back there, leave L.A. where he was the top baby face. And Tolis would have these fights. He would always come back and save the territory in L.A., but he would leave when he and LaBelle would have screaming matches, and he would go you know, to Houston and Dallas, and he would go to St. Louis, and then Pacific Northwest and work for Kaniski and Don Leo and uh, Dutch Savage. Um, because was it, was it mostly money? or Why, why did uh, Mike Le, uh, you said that there was... Tolis, the, Tolis, Tolis was a, is a lot like uh, superstar Billy Graham, that they inherently have a problem with promoters being the title promoter and being the boss. A lot of it is that. I mean, I know a lot of it was money, but I know when I brought up certain promoters' names to Billy Graham when we used to have lunch before COVID, uh, we'd have lunch almost on a weekly basis for years. Uh, I'd mention a promoter's name and he'd go, I, you know, and I can't even say what he'd say. And it was strictly, and I said, what kind of a dealing did you have? He said, ah, oh, you know, just a, blah, 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 blah. just bad-mouthing them because of the promoter being a boss and being the man that pays out. And he had that feeling about a lot of guys, and Tolis kind of did too. And I love Tolis. I mean, John was one of the nicest men. Uh, I cried a million buckets of tears, let me tell you, when Do John died. I talked to him six weeks before he he died. I, I gave him a call one day. In fact, I was in Billy Graham's parking lot of his apartment building, waiting for Billy to come out. And I got his number, uh, John's number from Carl Lauer. I gave John a call. And uh, John, I was afraid to talk to him because I knew he had, he had cancer and everything. I was afraid of hearing his voice. I was afraid he wouldn't take my call. I was afraid of everything. But he came on, he goes, hey, kid, how you doing? You know, and it was just, it was so good to hear John's voice. And, and I got to tell him how much I loved him and respected him and how much of an influence he was on me breaking into the business. Because I, like many, was in, in 1971 watching on TV with the Monsell's Powder with him and Blassie, that angle. Turned Greatest me on angle of all time. Greatest angle of all time. It's the only there? reason you're talking to me right now. Because without that angle, I would not be sitting here talking to you fine gentlemen right now. Do you I, think that was the greatest, greatest angle of all time? Yeah. And yeah. It, it, it was like they melted. They filled Blassie in the hospital with the eye patch. It was, it was perfect. Mike had the hottest territory at the time. So that L.A. was so perfect for this. And Blassie, as old as he was, was the ultimate baby face. I mean, what, what, he was like 50-something years old, wasn't he then? 50 years old? I mean, something I like that. I said this last night. You know who turned Blassie face was three cage matches with the Sheik at the Olympic. Three every other Friday. And see, it would take a heel like the Sheik to do that. It would take somebody of that magnitude and that great of a worker to know how to work the crowd. Now, you, uh, were stuck, you were stuck in Phoenix, but besides being a pallbearer a year ago, January, for Pampiro Furpo's funeral in San Jose, I was Chris, John's son, Chris Jr., because he was named uh, after John's fantastic wrestler brother, asked me because I'd run the Tolis Brothers fan club from 72 on uh, to be pallbearer for John. And one of my favorite feuds of all time that I photographed ringside was Furpo against Tolis. And I ended up being Paul Bear at both of their funerals. Uh, John's thing was there were very few of the boys there. There was uh, Jeff and his son, Scott. There was Mondo Guerrero. I think Rock Riddle showed up. 
I brought Richard Dawson's son, Mark, you know, the, the famous game show host, my best friend, Mark Dawson there. And like we were it at that Greek, uh, the beautiful Greek church. We were it from wrestling for John. Is there wasn't John anybody else. Anywhere, Mike? Pardon? Is John, was John laid to rest in? in, yeah. A, in yeah. And you know, the weird thing we had never, uh, as long as I'd known John, you, you probably on a different level, but uh, we had vacation with him in Hawaii when he was working for uh, the last couple of years, Ed Francis at the HIC in Honolulu. But um, we knew that he had a, um, a mistress or something back east and that his ex-wife shows up. And then a wrestler the, had a mistress? Yes. And he, he had a daughter with her from the Boston area. And so the mistress and the daughter came out to the funeral. And then there's, uh, I can't think of her first name now, Tolis's wife that he had the divorce from. And it was like real uncomfortable, but they, you know, we all got along because we all ate afterwards. We all went to bury him. And then we went to, I forget, whatever restaurant. And uh, everybody got along, but his daughter was a knockout. Uh, yeah, and I nobody had ever seen her. Chris, his own son had never seen this daughter, nothing. They just showed up. They didn't even say they were coming. Well, you know, I can tell you, Mike, John was one of a few guys just like uh, the Sheik that I really was a mark around. And I was I really respected him. And I got to work with John for WWF at the Olympic Auditorium on a show in 1984. Uh-huh. Uh, when they, when they, I guess the sports arena wasn't, wasn't available and they went back to the uh, old Olympic and then I got to work for, work against John on some indie shows at the San Bernardino Arena. And it was a thrill every time I was in the ring with that guy. I didn't care how hard he potatoed me. I could care less, mm. you know, uh, because it, you're in there with a legend. What does it matter? You know, you'll heal up. And John was stiff as a board, just like Iron Mike Sharp was, you know. <laughs> Who cares? It's part of the business, you know. Let, and, me, let me throw this out to everybody. Where do you rank? John Tolas, Billy Graham, Pat Patterson among the all-time greats. Oh, my God. It's so hard to rank. But those uh, guys, It doesn't have to be number two, three, or yeah, four. They're, but they're I would say easy top 10 or 20, right? Yeah, I agree, Evan. Yeah, I agree. Easy top 10. Yeah. You know, I mean, Billy in his prime in the 70s. I saw him work at Chicago Amphitheater in 73. I have a sister who lives mm-hmm. in Chicago, and I was visiting and he was on that card, along with Bachwinkle and Vern and all the guys. And, oh, my God, when he came down the aisle, I just never dreamed that he'd become such a good friend of mine through the years and things would develop. And, Mike, you were at our big church event in 96 uh, with when I worked with Jake Roberts and, yep. and that whole event. And I didn't know the closeness I would ever attain with Billy. Uh, and it's strange sometimes because, you know, Billy's a tough guy to deal with at times, you know, yeah. friendship. He's a very, 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 very opinionated man. I am too. We all are to a certain extent. But Billy, when he lays the law down on something, it's like, oh my God! You know, uh, it's it's are, tremendous. Are he and Valerie is Valerie still there, or is she back? Yeah, in- they're still together. They're together. Okay. They're together. And uh, Billy, uh, let's see. Today is Saturday, uh, Friday. Billy had part of his toe amputated yesterday. Wow. Uh, last night hit part. Uh, I guess he was describing it as about half of his big toe was going to be taken off mm. uh, one of his feet. So I haven't talked to him since. I haven't. I don't know what the results are of that. Uh, but he was in extremely good spirits despite that. I I I was going to make a joke with him because I could joke with Billy to a certain point. But I was going to say, man, you'll do anything to lose a few pounds. Yeah, you know, and, uh, but I I haven't had a chance to say that joke on him, so I'll say it nationally, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm surprised our connection has stayed this good for a while. I know we've uh, been pretty lucky. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So are you um, to edit this at all? I, well, I, we we try to get it straight through. You know, and, I got you. I got you. Haven't said so before we we go. Billy Graham came down. He was Spirit of America with the leather fringe jacket for Roy Shire. He worked there two years. Yeah, Tag Campy with Pat. But when he came to L.A., he returned to L.A. because he was originally there in 1970 with black hair, jet black hair with Jerry Graham as a new Graham brother. But he comes back around March of 72, and that's where the tie-dye started, the whole colorful stuff. He went to the AWA to feud with Wahoo and the rest of it there, and then Vince Sr. after. But the tie-dye and all the colorful stuff began in L.A., the feud with Tolis, teaming with Ernie Ladd, 
uh, feuding with yeah. Chris Tolis, all that yeah, magic Ernie stuff. Ernie Ladd was another man. What a tremendous man he was. I had Ernie Ladd in Newark, New Jersey. I went to an athletes conference with him, with Ernie. And in the airport, in Newark uh, airport, I had Ernie preaching to me. I sat on the floor as big as I am. Picture this, Mike. I'm sitting on the floor waiting for my plane to take off. And Ernie pulls his Bible out. And he says, grab a seat. And I said, there's yeah. no seat. He says, sit your ass on the floor. <laughs> I sat on the floor. And he reads out of the Bible to me. So I got Ernie the Cat Lad, who another guy I seen as a kid, and uh, oh, we lost our connection. No. Oh, my. Well, you know what? I, I guess, you know, we'll, we'll probably have to find a way to get Bill back on the show yeah. again sometime soon. He had so many great um, uh, uh, stories for us, and, uh, uh, you know, we we're not even close to... They reaching all oh, let's have it like, back because hey, if he's got a freeze, what better shot to be frozen with than that? Yeah, I agree. Like, I agree. Yeah, that's like he's cutting a promo. <laughs> yeah, we'll just, I, I'm sure, you know, may, uh, maybe later in the year we'll have a better, be able to get him with a better cell connection and, and uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to connect with him. If we uh, get him in, in the other room in his apartment, he, he could cut out every three minutes instead of every four. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, yeah. you know, technical difficulties, unfortunately, are the way of, of the COVID world. So we're, but we're right at, at just about an hour here. So, um, you know, I'd just like to know what your guys' final thoughts are for, for the show. And, uh, uh, you know, my, again, my final thought is I could certainly relate to everything Bill was saying because as I finished my book, there's 79 stories and 27 are about friends and wrestlers and legends that have passed so god mike i mean nikolai and johnny valiant and tiger khan and kowalski i have i have pieces on all of them these were our friends and and even up north you know i mean you know mike you and i have dealt with the death of of mark smith and virgil flynn and roland, uh, roland alexander roland alexander exactly a uh, crash holly you know another another he was one of our yeah he was one of our grads yeah and so you know it 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 unfortunately is a centerpiece of 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 all of our stories you know both uh, both coasts you know and, and and many years ago brian alvarez did a piece where he said that if you took a late 80s wwe pay-per-view and compared it to the nfl nba a National Hockey League, Major League Baseball, the death rate is so much higher in pro wrestling. You know, you, you, you can't run these guys into the ground 300 plus days a year. Even today, it's 250 days a year or whatever. You know, you, the human body needs rest and recovery. My, Mike has a medical background. He could explain it better than I can. But, you know, there's a reason people have pain pill addictions and, and die from this stuff. It's it's Maybe no this whole COVID time is going to have us reevaluate, you know, what health means and, you know, what, what people's health is in the long term. WWE, WWE has mountains of wrestlers. Give these guys an off season and let the guys who aren't on TV get some TV time. It's not but that in terms, of, uh, in terms of COVID, we have to get rid of that stigma because Chris Jericho and uh, one of the Jackson brothers, the Young Bucks, just admitted that they had COVID last August, but they tested positive. They were asymptomatic, but they quarantined. They, you know, didn't come close to anybody. They quarantined themselves for the 14 days and then were tested negative, but they didn't want to come out because it was, we have to get rid of the stigma. So I'm glad Undertaker's wife, you know, I don't know what her real name is, Michelle McCool, uh, just admitted that she had it and, and you know, so at least in terms of COVID, it, it should not, it's certainly not a shameful thing because it took folks like Kamala from us. Uh, and, and there were some other, you know, wrestlers and famous people too, uh, that we lost. Uh, so we got to get COVID knocked out. There's no doubt about it. It has to have a, a, a diamond death drop and we need to. Well, have yeah, the good test. news is that at least you are qualified to get a shot pretty soon. You know, the, They'll come your way and Evan's way before it comes my way. I'm not so. 65. <laughs> They're not giving me a shot yet. I'm almost Bill's age, but um, 
the, the fact, the problem is, and, and all of this should be rectified on uh, January 20th, is the current administration didn't buy enough of the vaccine and then didn't give it out. It's been a total shit mess. Uh, I'm sure he but, wanted it to have Trump's name on it, you know, on every syringe. You well, that's, actually, to... that's what his son said. And then some other comics said, we should call that, oh, you're going to get your Trump now, your vaccine. And I'm going, are you out of your minds? This guy is the reason we're at 400,000 deaths now in the United States alone. California is the hotbed. And, and, but Arizona is not far behind, you uh, know. Uh, it's, uh, we already have Bill saying that he got COVID himself. So it's it's tough all the way around. And, you know, I... They, we didn't they, they want to. Wanna... That's why I wanted to bring him on. When I hear, hey, uh, people report that uh, either Bill died or that he's in the hospital dying from COVID, and that's uh, I Facebooked him, and then I, I found out what his new email is. Maybe they I were just trying to reach him on. Maybe they were just trying to reach him on Skype, and that's why they thought he was. No, dead. they just heard rumors, and so I just said, "Well, screw that. I'm not going to say a word. I'm going to talk to Bill directly." And then we spoke uh, a couple of times, before, and I said, "I want to bring him on." Uh, a show, any show, and, and have him talk about his experience. You yeah, know, I, anybody can I, I get it. So don't be ashamed if you got it. I, I appreciate you bringing him in as a guest. Please give him our apologies that we couldn't have him throughout the whole show. Obviously, technical difficulties. And please invite him again because we'd like to have him again on our show. Oh, no, I, I think it's his, his the connection is Wi Fi there. It's not not your anybody's fault. Yeah, no, we, no, we've been okay. But, but please express to him when you talk to him again. Um, how we'd like to have him on the show because it wasn't fair that he got cut off so many times. It's not his fault, but we'd like to have him on the show again so we can get his his whole story completely in. He has sounds like he's got a million other great. He's got some great stories. This is Evan Will in his book. I just want to leave you with this: When Billy Graham came, returned back to our territory as a top heel, not just an opening card guy. Uh, he was vying against Killer Kowalski and Ernie Ladd. The three of them would uh -huh. be on alternate main events with John Tolis as our lead babyface. So can you? And Chris uh -huh. Tolis was there. And then the Sheik was coming in. So we had four of the top main event heels in all of wrestling. Uh, guys like Dory Dixon teaming up with Rocky Johnson. They were the tag champions. Can you imagine? We were killing it in 72, Los Angeles territory. I was Even watching I, it on TV in New York. It was an unbelievable territory back then. Was I was just getting out of diapers. <laughs> yes. It's a lot right. of fun. So right. support Still, the it was, it was in a magical time. It, it's something that we'd love to relive so with fun. them. Every time I would go bop to a new territory, I loved going to shoot Vince Sr., then the AWA, the IWA with Neil Moskers as champion was happening. And every place you would go, Florida, St. Louis, Detroit, Indianapolis, was a different, totally different experience from the refs, the ring announcers, the fans, the venue, the timekeeper, the, you know, everything was, and the boys, everything was so much fun. And, uh, and it's kind of that way now, a little bit with MLW and uh, Impact, who's having their pay-per-view tonight. And, uh, you know, it feels a little like we're getting back to Terry's. AEW, they're, they're really setting the standard, I think. So, Well, we'll talk to Bill about that some other time in the, in the yeah. near future. And please re-invite him. I will. Until Thank then. you guys for having me in the first place. You know, my big Thanks, mouth. Big mouth. The big mouth. That's why I'm a dentist. I've got a big mouth. <laughs> no, it was great having you on the show this week. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you all next week. All Good night, right. everybody. Tomo.